All right, so this may be new. This may be surprising, in fact, but did you know that Jesus actually expects, it would be interesting to do a series of messages on things that Jesus expects. (laughs) One of those that is the topic for this morning is the fact that Jesus expects his followers to fast. Now, I did not grow up in a fasting culture, uh, neither in my home it was never something that was never talked about. Uh, I became a Christian when I was 20. The church that I got uh, saved in, uh, came to know the Lord in, uh, I don't ever remember one mention of fasting. The, the seminary, the school that I went to, Eric, I don't know if you remember, but there was one week of lectures, Elmer Towns. Do you remember that? Uh, the only thing I ever remember hearing on fasting was one week of lectures, and most of us kind of debated and argued with the validity of what uh, well, I already said the name, but Dr. Towns was saying, I don't know that that's his forte, but anyway, he did. And that was kind of the beginning of an intro to me. It kind of came and went, and that was kind of it. And uh, that was kind of it for me. Fasting was just on the shelf for most of my Christian life. Now, I'm not to the 21-day juice fast yet. If you missed my story about that two weeks ago, uh, there's a fellowship of pastors. My real introduction to fasting a few years ago was with a group of pastors who start the year doing a 21-day juice fast, which to me is still pretty radical. I'm a long way from there. and No one expects you to be there either, okay? So you can take a deep breath. That's not what we're expecting, and I don't think that's what Jesus expects either. But I can tell you that growing the practices, or we like to say here at Restoration Church, the rhythms. Um, actually, Ryan mentioned a book to me. I, picked, I, was, I was thumbing through it the last uh, yesterday and this morning. Um, uh, uh, historically, you'll, uh, uh, Richard Foster, for example, the, the Christian disciplines, uh, celebration of discipline and, and Christian disciplines. Maybe you heard that in your circles or so on and so forth. We have preferred the term rhythm because uh, that's nice. It's a little easier to comprehend, I think, in our life. There's rhythms of life. There's rhythms. Did you know there's a rhythm of life in your neighborhood? Uh, there's a rhythm of life in Gaithersburg community, and, and, and those of you who work in government, you know that the rhythm of D.C. usually kind of goes with the congressional calendar in conjunction at times then with the school calendar. That's kind of how it is here. Uh, my wife grew up in rural Pennsylvania, and there, there are different rhythms and different holidays that students get off, like hunting and uh, things like that. So there's, there are rhythms that are important for us to be aware of in our community locally, but there are also rhythms in our life, and we like to talk about rhythms of spiritual formation, and that's what we're talking about here. And the rhythms of prayer and fasting in your life, they will have a significant impact as you grow them. As many of us have experienced in the last few years, as we've begun the year, each year for the last four years with 21 days of focused prayer and fasting. So we've talked about the importance of prayer and fasting for spiritual breakthrough. I've given a call to pray. And while I mentioned it briefly, there's another major benefit of fasting that can be a game changer. It has been a game changer for me and our family. And I believe that it will be a game changer and it can be and maybe already has been in your life too. Two weeks ago, I talked about how hard it is to change. And maybe you can relate to that. It's hard to change. For example, if you're used to eating steak and potatoes most nights, it's hard to go from that to having salad with a four-ounce piece of lean meat. Uh, I was in uh, Bible college, and uh, and it was in upstate New York, but for some reason that that school uh, had a drawing from a lot of the Midwest, and, and I met... Um, a, a lot of men and women who worked harder than anyone I'd ever been around, you know, farm folks, you know, Ohio, Indiana, the, you know, the different areas, and maybe some of you can relate. I know Bruce and Mary can, for sure. And I remember talking to one guy in my dorm, and him telling me, because I, I was like, man, we're ready to celebrate, and I think it was a, a transition or something, I don't remember, but, but I remember we were going to get steak for dinner, and when you're in college, and I don't know what college you went to or how good the food was, but we didn't have a lot of steak, you know, nice kind of things like that. And for me, it was a big deal. And I remember this guy, I could just picture the moment in the dorm, and him, he was like, dude, this is, uh, uh, he's like, I grew up at having steak and potatoes every day. Like, that's just what we had almost, almost every meal. So it's hard to change. Like, I don't know what your eating habits are, when you eat, what you have for breakfast. Why do, why do we have cereal for breakfast? 
Most of the world doesn't have cereal. Bagels and pastries and all kinds of things, donuts, you know, all kinds of things that should never be eaten. Well, they should never be eaten, but they definitely shouldn't be eaten for breakfast, and I know some of that's controversial. But, I, but the, the point of what I'm saying here is that it's hard to change. And how some change, I mentioned a couple weeks ago, can only happen through prayer and fasting. One of the core changes that I need, and I'm sure most, if not all of you do too, is in the area of self-control. And so the, the, if we're talking about self-control, how do we grow self-control in our lives? It's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. It's probably near the top of the list of the benefits of having focused times of prayer and fasting. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, and feel free to debate and share and, uh, and disagree with me on that, but I think the, the top of the list of why Christians in particular, why you as a follower of Jesus or in your spiritual journey, why you should consider prayer and fasting together is to grow self-control in your life. This is especially important coming out of a season where self-control is usually not at the top of our list. For many, the last couple of months, at least for us, from Halloween through New Year's, are difficult when it comes to saying no to certain things. There are a myriad of reasons why you and I may have given in to too much. Things like sweets, alcohol, meat, numerous other things that we tend to indulge in more. Some things we do less, like sleep, or maybe we sleep more. If you have a vacation, you travel more, you drive more. Your rhythms tend to be off. So if experiencing spiritual breakthrough isn't enough motivation, and I hope it is, but if it's not, I hope that growing self-control is enough motivation for you to take the next step in growing the rhythm of fasting in your life. Some people are shocked to hear that Jesus actually taught about fasting. And I sure haven't heard much teaching about it. Have you? <laughs> um, it's more popular, it's trendier today because the world is following that for health benefits and so forth. And I'm a fan of all that too, but we're talking about spiritual breakthrough. And we're talking about growing self-control, which is not just something that you grow on your own. It's something that the Spirit of God bears fruit of in your life, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness. You go down that list, and at the end of that list, self-control. Against which Paul says there is no, anybody remember? There is no law. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, Matthew 6, 16. Sermon on the Mount's kind of a big deal in the catalog of Jesus' messages, Right? If that was the message right there, and we just stopped right there, then what I said to start with would be true, right? Jesus expected his disciples to fast, his followers. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. And by the way, there's a big difference between being a hypocrite what does that mean? Being a hypocrite is, I'm, I'm saying that I believe this, but I don't really. I'm faking it. That's what a hypocrite is, right? Being hypocritical is something we all do. So hopefully none of us are really hypocrites, but we all struggle with always doing what we say we believe or do, right? So it's, there's a big difference between being a hypocrite and acting hypocritical. We don't want to act hypocritical. But we all, here and there, I mean, there's times where we just don't measure up to what we say we believe or do. That, that, that's the, uh, an important differentiation. Jesus says, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their face to show that they're fasting. They're saying that they're doing this practice, but they're just putting on a show. So obviously we don't want to do that. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Those who, oh, you're, oh, you, oh, you must be fasting. <laughs> How fabulous. Aren't you spiritual? Yeah, oh, yes. No, 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 really, it's nothing. <laughs> don't, don't mind the grease in my hair for the last, you know, five weeks or whatever. Fasting has traditionally meant going without food for a time, and I think when we see that throughout Scripture, it's almost exclusively food fasts, right? It's a spiritual rhythm, a spiritual practice. In order, we give up 
basic necessity of food in order to have a greater concentration to the Lord in prayer. That's the basic rhythm or discipline, right? Fasting seems to have been a normal way of life for Jesus and his followers and on into the early church and throughout the last 2,000 years. Now, we need to be very careful here not to allow our spiritual disciplines or our spiritual rhythms to turn into some type of badge of honor as if I'm among that distinguished group of Christians that fasts and pray. Oh, you're not? I feel bad for you. You, you know, second-rate Christian. Who, you, what, you don't fast? You only fast for lunch? <laughs> so you understand what I'm saying. We need to be very careful, very careful that we're not doing that. It happens when we do things for the wrong reasons, right? As a show for others to see how righteous or how close we are with God. And that's hypocrisy. And Jesus said, for those who do that, and so when you see someone doing that, you don't have to say anything. I mean, if it's someone in your fellowship or, you know, obviously let's confront that in grace and love. Um, but Jesus said, you already have received your reward in full. There's no other benefit for that. Uh, if, if someone's congratulating you for being such a great Christian, there's really no congratulations then from Jesus. You know, it, 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 assuming that's the motivation. I'm motivated to hear you tell me how righteous I am, and then that's all you get. But notice what Jesus said next. Verse 17. But when you fast, again, Jesus twice in a row has, expects the, the hearers of this to fast. When you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. So in, you know, today we might say, hey, don't like skip showers. You know, Don't just look miserable for the sake of looking miserable so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, of course, he's talking about the Heavenly Father, who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And some people would say, well, why are you talking about, Pat? well, you're doing a testimony in a service, so isn't it uh, debunking that? No, we're, we're trying to equip the church to do what Jesus taught us to do. And we're not doing it so someone thinks we're better. We're, we're, doing, we're talking about this and asking, you know, in our community group, we talk, hey, so how's it going? Some people share more than others, whatever, that's fine. I like to talk a lot about it because, not about myself, but I like to talk about it and hear from others because when I hear from others, that encourages me. And hopefully it encourages you too. We're not doing this so that other people hear. The, do you understand what we're, the reason why we're talking about it in the context of church is not so that someone else applauds Ruth. Oh, you are so, so righteous. Thank you for sharing. No, Ruth wants, wanted to share so that you would hear her experience, so that you'd be encouraged and maybe even challenged. And that's why we're doing this. Jesus was clear here. God will reward those who fast for the right reason. There are probably many rewards, but I want to focus on three of them during this fast. Growing self-control, getting healthier, definitely a benefit, and experiencing a spiritual breakthrough. Could be in different order for you. Maybe it's the first and foremost a spiritual breakthrough. Maybe you're not even thinking about the health benefit. Maybe some of you have already been practicing fasting, and that's not really an issue. It's more of just a spiritual breakthrough. But for me, I know the benefit of growing self-control. I've, I've done it enough now to know that this is a real key, not just in these 21 days, but as a rhythm in your life. Hopefully that's what's going to happen, is you'll, experiencing, you'll experience something at the beginning of the year as you come out of the holidays that gets you kind of focused on the right track in a new year. There's some new momentum. You start to feel a little better. There's some health benefit. And as you're sharper, as you're clear, now I can hear the Lord speaking to me, and there's an opportunity then. I'm in a posture, I'm, I'm in a position in which God can really work in my life and bring some breakthrough that I need. Now, I can't promise that you're going to experience miraculous things when you fast. Jesus didn't really promise that either. He just said there will be some reward. And if he meets you in those moments, that's the greatest reward you ever get anyway. But I'm pretty confident that you will grow self-control Pretty confident that if you do it right, maybe in consultation with a doctor, okay, that there's some health benefits, and to grow your relationship with Jesus, if not, experience a significant breakthrough. 
So let's talk for a minute about self-control. We live in a culture that doesn't celebrate self-control necessarily. Oh, we do in professional athletes. We do in, you know, high level, you know, leaders. But for the everyday Joe, we would prefer to watch a reality TV show about people who have self-control. We'd rather watch a documentary and be wowed as we eat popcorn and stuff our face with all kinds of good stuff. You know, we would rather do that, wouldn't we? Uh, We want everything now. We want everything instant from food to shopping, instant health results that just buy this in six minutes a day, sitting on your couch, drinking soda, you'll lose five pounds a week, you know, whatever it is. The culture sells life your way, highlighting instant gratification. In fact, one of the catchiest commercials now. BK, have it your way. You rule. You know, in our in our house, that's one of our favorites. That's gotta be like back in the 80s and 90s, there were incredible, you know, catch tunes and whatever. It's kind of, I don't know, that the that's not so popular these days. BK has crushed that, man. If you haven't, don't know what I'm talking about. Burger King, you know, BK, have it your way. And that commercial, you know. And I mean, it doesn't motivate me at all to go to Burger King. I have no plans on being there, but, but that's, right, that's it, right? Have life your way, you rule. Isn't that interesting? A marketing slogan ends with you rule. It's kind of the opposite of what we're looking for, right? No, actually... Lord, it's not my way, not my way, not my will, but your will. It's your way that I'm seeking. And hopefully that's the core benefit here. So if what you want is temporary pleasures in this world, then yes, you can have it your way now. (laughs) But if you want to experience true joy and life in Jesus, the way that he created us to live, then self-control is key. A person who lacks self-control is actually dangerous. Proverbs 16, 32. And we've all seen people like this. Maybe we've been that person before. Better a patient person than a warrior. Whoa, man. I don't know. Some of the guys, maybe even some of the women are like, what? Like we, who do we put on the stage? You know, one of the things I was talking to a pastor friend of mine the other day. And we were processing, he he made a comment to me about how heartbroken he is about just the failures of prominent leaders in the Christian church over and over again. And then as I was processing, something that I've been changing in my life is, uh, you know, you, you don't go to conferences and have people like the prominent pastor Ed Choi speak, whose, you know, congregation is... 30 to 40 on Sundays, at, you know. But no, you, you, go to, you go to these conferences, Christian conferences, right? And you go and you listen to pastors who pastor churches of thousands of people and their life is nothing like my life. Nothing. Their leadership is nothing. It's ne- there's not, and, and then they're, te- they're trying to teach you how to do things that get you somewhere that you're never going to get to. And then you get frustrated. And you try to force the, I mean, this is just a, my experience anyway over the last 20 years. To, oh, I learned this great thing, and now I'm going to implement this in my church, and it's going to be great. And man, have we failed. I don't I mean we, but the church has just failed. Maybe you've been a part of that. And I think a lot of those churches and a lot of those pastors are well-intentioned. They're not meaning to manipulate anybody. And I said to my buddy Tony, who hopefully you'll get to meet here, he's going to come and preach. He was just in Korea for uh, eight or nine years. And... Um, and I said, bro, I, I think what we need to do is listen to pastors who are doing what we feel God has called us to do. And then during this season of life, I get blessed by this book. And, and the title of it is The Ordinary Pastor. And I'm like, more of that, please. And uh, D.A. Carson's dad, Tom Carson, pastor and just faith. How about we need more stories And I want to encourage you to read more stories and biographies of of people who are more like you, who they uh, accomplish maybe great things because they're faithful. And they're heading in the same faithful direction over a decade. Those are the people that I want to be like. And I just believe that if we are faithful, little as much when God is in it, right? If we're faithful, I don't know what size, maybe this church will just be a church of 50-ish people for 10 years from now, and that's all, that's fine. But we're going to be faithful to serve and bless 
and make a big deal of Jesus' name. So better is a patient person than a warrior. We often follow those warriors. One with self-control than one who takes a city. It's normally the people who take cities, though, that get the book deals. How about Proverbs 25, 28? Like a city whose walls are broken down through a person who is, I'm sorry, like a person, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. It's not good. And by the way, I just want to be real careful. Let me just add one caveat to what I just said. I'm not being critical. Like I'm not some uh, bitter, small church pastor wanting to be something else. And I'm not trying to be bit, uh, bitter or even critical of large church pastors. I know many of them who are wonderful people. One of my core mentor, mentors, pastors of Mega Church in Hagerstown, he's a great friend. He's been very generous to us. And he's not trying to encourage me to be like him. And so I hope I'm clear on that. I'm not trying to, a lot of small church pastors are, and they're, they just criticize. And I'm not trying to do that. I just want to be careful. If I'm a church, small church pastor, then I'm a small church pastor. I'm not trying to be a mega church pastor. You know what I'm saying? Hopefully that makes sense. Now, in the context of marriage, 1 Corinthians 7, 5, for those married folks among us, do not deprive each other. I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay, You can kind of guess what, there's children in the room, but do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. This is a, uh, well, I don't use the word, but it's a, it's a blank fast. Okay, fill in the blank. Okay? Intimacy fast, if you will. Then come together so Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. It's a big deal. It's a big deal in the context of marriage. Galatians 5.23 says self-control is part of the f- Spirit's fruit in our lives, which I've already said. 1 Timothy 3.2 says a leader in the church must have Self-control. Titus 2 says older men and older women are to teach younger men and younger women to be self-controlled. And did you know in the list, there's a list of things. Older men are to teach younger men all these things. Older women to teach younger men, uh, younger women these things. One word in those lists are the same. There's one thing that Paul is teaching older men and older women to teach younger women and younger men. Self-control. Isn't that what young men and young women need? And there are lots of other unique, different things that they need, despite what the culture is going to tell you and all that. But young women need some unique things that they need to learn only from older women. And younger men, there's some things that younger men need to learn only from older men. And then Paul concludes, Titus 2.12 says, The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control the grace of God is teaching this as it and really some people would say the grace of God there we could just say is Jesus the grace of God teaches us to say no and to live self-controlled upright and godly lives in this present age it's a big deal growing self-control is core it's central it's key to flourishing in the Christian life amen I mean, I don't know about you, how excited you get about that. Yes, man, we're having a self-control revival. (laughs) I mean, but just think about the difference in our lives. Just think about the difference in our neighboring, the difference in our testimony, just the difference of our impact in the world if the church was was made up of more people that are self-controlled. It grows as we walk daily with Jesus and in part can be fueled by fasting. Part of our problem is that we have unhealthy habits, don't we? Like if we're real, we just have unhealthy habits. Maybe, maybe it revolves around sleep. Maybe it revolves around technology and social media. Maybe it just revolves around you know, eating and when we eat. And maybe there's just, maybe for many of us, there's just some tweaks here and there. And, and through fasting, those things clarify i think in in ruth's testimony they they sharpen we have more foot we can see with god's eyes a little bit more clearly when we when we strip away the excess we idolize we idolize rather food and often drinking rather than being filled with the spirit and growing self-control it's painful to say no sometimes practicing delayed gratification is not easy I mean, it's one of the things that I'm 
I'm trying uh, as strategically as I can to implement with my kids. You know, we, we fail at this a lot, but we're supposed to, you know, leave our phones, have a break from our phones in the evening after dinner. We have some time that we have on that. and We have some time that we need to be away from that. And delayed gratification is, you know, I think 50 years ago was a little more embraced in the culture than it is today. Now it's BK, have it your way. It's painful. Delayed gratification can be difficult, but it's something we can grow in. And fasting is a tool that God uses to shape and form us into Christ likeness. So I just want to uh, hereby declare this, as I did last week, as a call to fast. You don't have to give a testimony. You don't have to share anything. You don't have to tell anybody. And that may be your conviction. And certainly we honor and respect that. But consider this my official call as pastor of this church that you enter in with us as a church in some way the rhythm of fasting and prayer. Now I'm not a fasting expert by any means, but I can say that fasting is not optional in the Christian life. It's not something that Jesus is like, well, you could fast or not. And I think, no, you, you should. And if there are health types of issues, uh, you, if you need some help with this, I can certainly help give a little bit of guidance. But this is something that maybe you do in conjunction with, your, with some health professionals. Maybe it's not food at all. Maybe, there's some, maybe you're on a strict kind of dietary limitations and that's fine. And so maybe for you, it's adding some different things. And like, like we have in our home. And so, uh, and maybe in your home, you, you don't drink alcohol anyway. So for us, we, we, we set aside the whole month instead of 21 days. And in part, to honor uh, our dear brother Ross, who did that the first year we did that. And so I'm going to do that every January, just in honor of, of Ross. Some of you knew Ross. And we did it for 21 days. And he, from day one, he was like, I'm doing it for 30, 31 days. Are you? <laughs> what, what, do you what do you say, Pastor? What am I going to say? I'm like, oh, man, I had a party planned, you know, for the playoffs. Or what is it that I really want, you know? So anyway, whatever that looks like for you. But Jesus does expect us to fast and for that to be a part of our devotion to him. So if this is new, I just want to encourage you to take a small step. Consider giving up an extra thing, an extra sweet or indulgence. Maybe a meal that you normally cook meat and you just leave meat out on Wednesday night dinners or something like that. Cut down or cut out alcohol on a night that you would normally drink. Or if you're out, maybe instead of ordering something, you just drink water with your meal. If you have health issues, again, please be sure that you talk to your doctor first. I'm not that kind of doctor. <laughs> then with the extra time or with the slight hunger or the desire that you have, go to God in prayer. Identify one area, as we've talked about, where you need a breakthrough and surrender it to God in prayer. Surrender it to God in the morning, in the afternoon, if you have a job that allows you to be able to do that, in the evening, even if you just take a moment. And God, I'm just asking, I'm coming back to you again. Set, set your alarm, you know, set, have a prayer alarm uh, once a day, twice a day, three times a day, whenever it is, however, wherever you are. And I'm encouraging to go from where you are to what might be a next step. Include the other areas of breakthrough. Pray for the church. Pray for me and my family. We covet your prayers. Pray for our leadership and the team here that's needed to serve this church and this community well. Ask God what role he wants you to play in being an answer to those very prayers. Ask God to clarify your gifts and your calling. We have a resource. I'll share more about this next week. I'll share this in our luncheon. And in the weeks to come, we'll talk more and more about uh, our, um, a tool that we have called the shape assessment. And that's something that you can take on your own. We can help kind of facilitate that. You can do it online or you can do it in, on, on paper. And that will just help understand your spiritual gifts, your heart, passion, your abilities, your personality, your experiences, and how God is using all of that to want to use you in and through a local church. And that doesn't mean every Sunday, it doesn't, you know, and it may even not be on Sundays. It may be behind the scenes. It may be technical music, you know, whatever. It might be starting something that we don't even have existing. And, uh, I already said that. Okay. So God wants to bring restoration in you and through you. And he wants to speak and move through us through prayer and fasting. And so now let's pray. Let's get, ask God to not only grow self-control in us as we've talked this morning, but to bring restoration to others through us. 
as we begin this last week of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Please join me as we pray, and then Elliot's going to lead us in some uh, response.